Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mark Bell's Power Project podcast, hosted by Mark Bell, co-hosted by Nsima Iang and myself, Andrew Zaragoza. This episode is recorded on June 23rd, and it is with our buddy, Casey Mitchell. Casey Mitchell is a veteran who was actually blown up in Afghanistan, and uh, when he came home, he found powerlifting and still has, uh, even though he had to get amputated, um, he still managed to deadlift 600 pounds and compete in a full powerlifting meet, so bench, squat, and deadlift, uh, all on a prosthetic leg so a very inspira- uh, inspirational dude um, one of our favorites he recently started up his own supplement company and we got into a, a lot of the the ins and outs of an actual supplement company is really cool him explaining how you can actually just go get a pre-workout made extremely cheap and still you know upsell it for way more than he actually paid and um, what he plans on doing differently with his company and how he's actually been able to grow during the uh, the uh, quarantine during the lockdown during this whole pandemic thing and um, we got a lot of uh, of his thoughts on the current uh, current events going on with George Floyd uh, Richard Brooks and um, defunding the police and I won't go into too much detail but he gives us a really really good uh, explanation as to why we need to not defund the police we actually need to fund them a little bit more so that way they can get the proper training we also learned that Casey is actually having a hard time balancing his new business, uh, family, and uh, his fitness. So it's really cool to see how somebody who has been, you know, an elite power lifter is actually having a hard time balancing everything. And we learned what he's going to do to actually get out of uh, this rut that he's found himself in. So lastly, before I get out of your guys' way, time is ticking. If you guys haven't taken advantage of markbell.com by now, um, what are you waiting for? You guys only have a couple of days left to register and sign up for a free 30-day trial. You guys will gain access to the paid version as well as the premium version. Uh, That costs a little bit more, but right now for you, it's 100% free. All you have to do is go to markbell.com, register, and you'll gain access to the entire website for 30 days for absolutely free, but you have to do it before the end of June. And uh, looking at the calendar, you guys have about a week left. So don't hesitate. Just get up there, uh, register. And again, like I said, it's absolutely free. So you got nothing to lose. That's it for me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy this episode with the great Casey Mitchell. It's crazy. It's 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 different than jujitsu because jujitsu, you can't really um, I can't get lucky against you. You know, like if we were to roll, I can't really get, you know, as I mature and as I learn more and as I gain more knowledge, yeah, sure, I could probably, uh, you know, get lucky here or there. Or you, you, you are working on something that's so different for the day mm-hmm. uh, that, yeah, maybe somebody can catch you off guard here or there and you end up in a compromising position. But for the most part, it's just not it's like it's it's not impossible, but it's pretty close, right? Dude, no, you, it's 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 funny. That's exactly it. If you're rolling with but if somebody, we're punching each other, they can get a and if you're super skilled at punching and I'm not, I still might end up just clipping you with something weird out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. The likelihood is 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 smaller, but it could still happen, especially yeah. amongst people that are big. Got two big guys swinging at each other. Mm hmm. I mean, we've seen it happen, and in, 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 I've seen it happen in like real fights. I've seen it happen in the UFC. Someone just throws a throws one from the fence, kind of deal. Yep, just blast the guy. Yeah, you got a, a, a puncher's chance or a fighter's chance or whatever they mm-hmm. call it. Have you yeah. guys ever watched Francis and Ganu punch? <laughs> it's just like that's a video game. That's like a video game. Thing. It's a video game, but yo, Francis and Ganu has the same exact punch. It's like. Mm. And that is pop. like he, it's, <laughs> if you watch his highlights, every single knockout is. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> like it just—it's the same thing, but super quick. Oh man, he's it's got so funny, so much power, and he's so fast. Oh my god, Chuck Liddell used to really throw his punches from his hip, kind of like what we saw Cody Garbrandt do recently. Mm. <sighs> like the punches, like really, like a like a real windmill, mm-hmm. like wind up punch, where you're like, what the hell was that? It's like fun to watch. You're like, I, <laughs> like I haven't seen. But Liddell was like, uh, you couldn't take him down. He was really good at sprawling and, and keeping people away from his legs. And then he would just throw a giant bomb at you, and he would eventually hit you. And then as he got a little older, that strategy wasn't great because, mm-hmm. you know, then you're going to get clipped because you're a little slower. Uh, or maybe you become a little, like, punch drunk, and every time you get hit, it's mm-hmm. worse than it used to be. That's one thing that gets me about boxing. I've been messing with our heavy bag and our other bags here, but ooh. oh, look at this guy! Wow, is Man. he a sauna? 
<laughs> no, no. <laughs> Bro, you're sweating it out over there in the sauna. I am. What you got going on, Casey Mitchell? Great to have you on the show today, buddy. Thanks, thank you. I uh, just out messing around a little bit, getting some cardio in this morning. Cool. I know that uh, you know you're you're not a guy that's going to slow down. I know that uh, during this like quarantine and stuff, it wasn't too um, it wasn't probably too far away from the time that you started to really ramp up your supplement company and stuff. So, give us a little background on that. I know that you did start the supplement company well in advance of the quarantine, but uh, that must have been some interesting times to to try to go through with a new company. Yeah, it was uh, definitely unexpected. You know, I think my company was about eight months, about eight months, nine months old when the whole quarantine hit. So a uh, very scary situation for a new company to, you know, be going through that. Not just that, you know, while I was going, you know, being a new company, I was also going through an expansion of expanding the company as well. And uh, pretty much right when I expanded is kind of when everything kind of hit. So a uh, very scary situation, but um, just uh, tried to stay focused and, and tried to stay relevant as much as I could. And, uh, you know, I did notice that a lot of people were still doing some type of training. And so we um, we're just trying to stay stay ahead of it, you know, with them, like, you know, with making sure that people understand that we're still here to, you know, ship out to them that we were still, you know, doing everything that we could, that we were like, in a, I guess you could say the essential business part that we were able to still stay open. Um, but uh, what I also did is that, you know, we had a lot of major sales because obviously people were going to be financially hurting or people were going to be financially scared. And I didn't want them to not want to purchase due to the fear of, mm-hmm. you know, of the inevitable of like, if they're going to have money, what the future holds. Um, not just that, I understood that it was a hard time for a lot of people. So, you know, we had a lot of sales. We, we cut the prices quite a bit to uh, kind of help each other out basically i wanted to help the consumers out and i wanted the consumers to help me out by just being able to stay in business so um that's what i did and it and it worked and it got me through it and uh you know coming out of the last little bit last you know what was it um may was one of my biggest months ever for my company Mm -hmm. you know and it was due to the fact of i feel like we were just pushing volume on people is it uh do you feel that it's harder to uh start a business does it take more energy to start a business or do you feel like it takes this, a similar amount of energy or more energy to continue a business well I've, you know I, I tell myself about i think i tell myself weekly you know uh, uh whether or not i'm gonna swallow a pistol or not <laughs> so, uh, i have to say that this is the hardest thing that i've ever done in my entire life and um it, it's definitely harder than anything I've done. Like I said, it's just, it's mentally draining. And at the end of the day, it's like you, it's, it's so hard to even be motivated to like work out or do anything because you're just mentally drained. And it's the first time that I've really felt like that just cause there's so much going on. And, um, yeah, at the end of the day, I'm pretty much done. Yeah, is, is that that mental uh, fortitude is is tough to kind of keep pace with when you're, you know, going through a full day worth of work. Do you think a lot of it has to do with the responsibility? Like, it's all on your shoulders, and even even if something goes wrong in the company that you passed off to somebody else, you still may have passed it off kind of incorrectly or didn't communicate uh, well enough to get the particular result you were looking for. Is that kind of, you know, all the weight kind of falling on your own shoulders? Is that the hardest part for you? Yeah, I, it, it definitely is. I'm, you know, you know, every decision you make either can make or break the company, and uh, you know, and not just that. It's like you know, you don't want to have that like I guess potential embarrassment of like failing, you know. And so, um, you know, me, I don't. I'm just a grad. I graduated high school, joined the military, airborne infantry, blown up. I don't have any college. I don't have any <laughs> business background. You know, I've been. I've learned everything that I've done so far on the fly. And I'm learning on the fly still as to how to run a business and um, and and keep it moving forward. And, and and I have I do make mistakes, you know. And but I learn from those mistakes. And then I do do sit back a lot and watch other companies. And I jump off of like and learn off of their mistakes as well. I'll see some companies do things, and I'm like, ooh, I don't know about that one. <laughs> and it doesn't go well. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to do that one. You, you know? don't want to so, follow that CrossFit path. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah, yeah. I try to cancel I try cult to culture. I trust me. I, I think I went to post several things that as I get ready to post something, I delete it and just get rid of it. I'm like, you know what? 
No, not, 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 not today. I think I've done it about seven times. That's actually smart, though, because sometimes it's like it's your vantage point. It's your point of view for the for the moment. And sometimes it's hard to uh, persuade people to kind of believe in your vantage point. And sometimes it's just not even worth it because some people right. just might not understand where you're coming from. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think sometimes like, um, OK, for example, like I was about to post something about. And I'll say it now about that that, that horrendous uh, uh, bench, uh, world record bench that just was supposed to happen. I mean, just so I was just I'm so disappointed because I feel like lately strength, uh, strong man, strength, powerlifting type stuff is make has so many opportunities right now to be like televised all over the world. Yeah. And it was like Thor, John, you know, Thor went and I just felt like the commentators were boring. <laughs> I felt like I was watching golf. Yeah. And good I love call. Golf, I agree. Like watching it just like. There was no hype. It was I was like, what is this? You know, it, it was terrible. And I, I, I feel like that was a great opportunity for a world record deadlift to happen. And there wasn't a lot of hype. The commentators were terrible. Then you have, you know, uh, the bench press go down and it looks like a shit show. It looked like a shit show. There was just people everywhere, crowded everywhere. Uh, you know, the weight wasn't even loaded correctly. Oh, and I'm God. like, come on, guys. Like, I was just. I think I, wrote, I went to write a bunch of things multiple times to post about just what a shit show that was and how disappointing I feel like it is to the strength community when we're when there's so many we're getting actual opportunities right now ESPN and everything like that to showcase and it's just done unprofessionally you know and I wanted to voice my opinion on that a couple of days ago but I was like you know what you know he just went for it I'm sure I mean everybody's already kind of dogging it out about it and there were just so many things that I seen wrong that when that went down, I just was like, just how embarrassing for the sport completely. Yeah, the weight was misloaded. That was rough, man. Yeah, and that's hard to come. But like we, when you're lifting that kind of weight, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean he unloaded. I and thank God he's so damn strong that he was able to hold it and put it back. And uh, people don't understand like holding that type of weight, <laughs> uh, how much how much that probably took out of him, you know. To, and then to go to do it again, it's just I mean. Uh, you know, it's, it's it will, I don't know the chances of him doing it again like that, you know. So, I don't know. I was just a little disappointed because I was pretty hyped. And, you know, I sit there and I, I try to promote powerlifting just like you. And we try to make it um, more relevant in this world and more exciting and try to get more people involved. And when you have these big, massive opportunities and you have these long periods of time to get everything ready for it, you just think it would be done a little bit better. Yeah, I hope that it gets another shot. You know, I hope that based off of that, like uh, if it didn't get great views and if it didn't get great hype then i hope that uh somebody just recognized hey like we could probably do this a little bit better we should give it one more go give it one more shot powerlifting live having powerlifting be live i think is um is is would be very very challenging maybe the only scenario that i could think of would be like a round robin type of thing where the weights are the same You know, it's like, all right, Casey Mitchell's going to go up. He's going to take a crack at 600 and Seema is going to take a crack at 600. I'm going to take it. Then you could clearly see like which guy picked up the 600 pounds or which guy was able to advance to the 650 or something like that. And you would clearly see it was competition. But there wasn't really in that um, particular show, there wasn't really a lot of explanation of even what powerlifting was, is or what what a decent bench press is like they could have started out yeah. saying like you can go to almost any commercial gym in the world and find a bunch of people that bench around four plates you know but some of these right. guys are doing five plates six plates seven plates and i guess in julius maddox's case eight plates which is just this uncharted yeah. territory and that that would have been cool to have a little bit of comparison and stuff like that thrown in there yeah absolutely i agree i just like i said it was just I wanted to post stuff, but I was like, you know, it was a little bit, I was, I was running off emotions and I was just like, all right, I'm just going to go ahead and delete this one and just <laughs> let it run out for a couple of days. But now I'm getting to say it. So I just, like I said, it's just, I want to see it. I wanted to see it conducted a little bit better, you know, if it's going to be done. You know, how about training right now for you? Because you mentioned that like every single day is immensely draining and you don't even have the energy to train. And right now, I don't know how the gym situation is for you. But with that being said, with everything with your business, um, are you actually finding it more difficult to get in as much as you were? And are you getting in as much as you were because of the whole COVID stuff that's been going on? So it's funny because I was legitimately just about to do a big talk about this, uh, mostly to call myself out. Uh, to my, to everybody in the sense of that. I feel like I I'm, I'm kind of disappointed in myself uh, due to the fact that I feel like I'm not training as hard as I was. 
And that uh, there are days that I'm like, you know, I'm just so mentally drained that I'm like, no, I'm just not, I'm just, I just don't train. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, my training has been, you know, subpar, honestly. And I was about to call myself out on it because, you know, um, there's just guys out there that are doing what I'm doing 10 times more. Like, you know, Mark runs his business as he trains the rock, the busiest man in the world. He trains, you know, Andy Priscilla, he runs his crazy business. He trains. And, uh, it's what it is for me is that I'm still struggling on finding balance with everything. That's like my hardest thing that I'm doing right now. And I'm like, Oh, you know, for example, I had 300 orders to get out yesterday and realistically, do I have to get all 300 orders out in the, in that day? No. Would it be great? Yes. But I'm so hard on myself and I, I care so much about my business over everything else that I'll sit there and I'll work from morning until night to get all 300 orders out. And then by the end of that, I don't have anything left in me to really train. And so, you know, it, it's for me right now, I've, I've just really have struggled finding that balance in my life, you know, where I'm, you know, my training to my business, to being a dad, to just having a, a, a like a, a social life, you know? And so it, it has sucked lately. My training has been subpar. Uh, I'm kind of like been upset. With, I was actually a little bit upset with myself last night. And, uh, you know, today I was going to like do this whole little post about, you know, uh, calling myself out to where, you know, this is maybe the one time that I need, you know, my fan base to kind of keep me accountable. You know, I, I feel like I keep people, you know, I motivate and keep people accountable all the time. You know, let me get a little bit of accountability here and there, you know, and, and I feel like if I was to post something that not just that, I feel like it allows people to see that, like, you know, I too will, you know, take breaks and struggle and, 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 and slack off, you know, we all slack off. And, uh, uh, and, and like I said, I just wanted to call myself out on it. So I guess I'm calling myself on it right now. So yeah, my, it, it has been a struggle to, um, find balance in everything so far. Yeah. A lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, your perspective and your expectations of yourself. You know, you're, you're a survivor. You're somebody that survived war. And it's like, how many people can say they survived war? How many people can say they survived being blown up? Like that is just a, there, there's not a lot, right? There's not a lot of people. And so I think the expectations that you have for yourself are not only are they high, maybe they're sometimes uh, excessive, you know, maybe sometimes they're just not reasonable for you to keep all those plates uh, spinning all at the same time without some of the plates, you know, falling down and, and crashing to the floor. I think it's just going to happen here and there. And I think that um, it's OK to be honed in and focused on something like a heat seeking missile for a while, you know, for a period of time. And then you can readjust and you can reassess. But I think a lot of men in general, I can't really speak from the lady side of things. So I don't know what that's like, but from the guy's side of things, I see a lot of men really getting into business or getting into certain certain things and they get so locked onto it and they're like this is for my family you know for you this is for my yeah. daughter this is for my significant other and then it's like when by the time you get home you don't have anything left for any for anybody else and you don't you, you, yeah, know, you can't play with your kid barely because you're just shot and you're not really you end up like not really being there and it's a tough situation i've seen it happen it happened with my own dad i remember when i was a kid uh my mom you know just like stopped my dad dead in his tracks and said hey you're working too much and he was like so confused because he was like, isn't this what I'm supposed to do? Like work my way up the ladder? Isn't that what you kind of wanted? And she's like, yeah, but not at the expense of you never being around. And he's like, what? Right. <laughs> like he didn't even know. Like he didn't even know. So yeah, it can happen to a lot of people because you're you're chasing after that idea of success and you're you're trying so hard, you're putting so much into it that you barely even recognize uh, you know, how drained you are. But it's great that you're being open about it and it's great that you recognized it so quickly. It's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely, it's taken a minute, you know, and, uh, and, and I, and I feel like that's, that's where it's at for me too. It's, uh, you know, uh, I want one supplement company to make it in the supplement industry is very, very hard because it's a very saturated industry and it's very hard to make it, you know? And so, you know, to keep the growth and keep going, it's, it's, it's a lot of work every single day, but yeah, I've caught myself realizing that, you know, yeah, I want to build this great thing to give my life, my daughter, this great life, you know, but I have been like, you know, noticing that I've been missing out or I get home and I'm just a little bit tired. Uh, you know, you're a little bit more irritable, 
you don't have the tolerance to kind of sit there and, and when they're, you know, she's 10. So when she wants to be playful and goof off, I'm like, not in the mood, you know? And, and I, you know, and I'll, and I'll catch myself. Like I'll see myself do something like she'll want to show me this little TikTok that she made. And I'm just like, no, you know, I'll just be like, no, like not right now, man. Like, you know, or, you know, and, and, and then, and then she walks away and then I'm like, oh, you stupid ass. Like this is something she did, you know? And, and so I'll call her and I'll tell her, I'll, I catch myself very quick. Cause uh, I'm very, you know, everybody knows how I feel about my daughter. So, you know, uh, I'm very quick to catch myself and be like, Hey, c- get over here. I'm sorry. You know, let me see what you got going on, you know? And it's just as she's excited and I'm tired and her energy's a little bit more than mine at the time. And I'm just, you know, you know, a little bunny rabbit jumping around the house. You just want to smack it away a little bit, you know, but <laughs> no, I, I have caught myself, um, you know, and uh, I'm trying to get better at it for sure. In terms of the supplement company, what got you wanting to start that anyway, being that it is so saturated? Like what, what spurred the idea for you? Um, you know, when I came into the first came into this industry, I started out just as an ambassador in the industry, you know, just like anybody else, you know, and I started as an ambassador was with a, a supplement company and then became an athlete with a supplement company. And as I was just kind of going through that, I just noticed a lot of things that they were doing that I didn't, I thought I could do better. But then I just noticed that supplements, I feel like nowadays, have lost the good reputation for what it is that they're supposed to be doing. I mean, I mean, you hear so many supplement companies nowadays that are getting caught putting fillers and just not putting the actual ingredients and in what's in it. And, and it's, you know, then you get, then when you get to a point where the consumers are like, well, what makes your product so much better than theirs, you know? And that's just because, that's just because there's so much shady stuff out there. And, um, you know, and then I, when I first had the idea to do this, I remember going down and talking to a manufacturer and this is what's crazy right here is what blew my mind. Cause I went into the manufacturer and I explained to them what I was wanting to do. Their first word to me was, well, how much do you want to spend on a pre-workout? And I was just like, what? They're like, well, how much do you want to spend? Do you want to spend $5 on a pre-workout, $7, $10? And I was like, I don't, I don't really have a, I just, I don't have a price. I know what I want to formulate, you know, and I, I know what I want to formulate. And then, I guess you just tell me the price. I was like, do people come in and say, I want to, I want a $5 pre-workout and you make it. And they said, Oh yeah, all the time. And that's crazy to me. Yeah. That is just like, you give this, you tell this company, you have this amount of money that you want to spend on a pre-workout five bucks. And they formulate it for you to make that quota of five bucks. And then they flip it around and sell it for 41 bucks. And that's when you get crappy product, you know, and that's when you get the consumers being like, it's all the same because everybody comes in wanting to spend the less amount to pay it to, to, to charge the most amount to have the biggest margins. And I just couldn't understand how that is good business at all. And so I go in there, I tell them what I want to create. We create it. And then they tell me how much it costs. And then I find out what's competitive out there. And then I put my price based on that. That's how I work. And am I going to be a millionaire as fast as this guy? Probably that's doing a $5 pre-workout at 40 something dollars. Nope. He's going to be a millionaire faster than me, but my goal is to be around for a lot longer than him. You know, I look at companies like, you know, first form been around forever. Um, Hani with Evogen been around forever. Those companies, the reason they've been around forever is because they have high quality, good products and they're respected. And so that's where I feel like there's not a lot of those. So I feel like there's not a lot of uh, saturation in the respected, um, side of like supplements. So I try to put myself up in the realm of that. And it is hard. It is hard to grow fast when my margins are a lot smaller than a lot of other companies that are out there. And, you know, I've sat down with some multi-million dollar CEOs of supplement companies and there was one, I won't say his name in particular, but I remember sitting down with him next to him in Houston at an expo and I was getting ready to launch. I just launched my company and we were talking and he was, he was great. He was just like, asking how everything's going. And, uh, we were just going back and forth, and the, all I remember him saying is, I don't care what happens. All I care about is just being the fastest-growing supplement company ever. So he doesn't care so much about the quality. He just wants to be the fastest-growing supplement company to ever be, to live. Mm-hmm. That's what makes him go to sleep at night. That doesn't make me go to sleep at night. Like, that, do, that doesn't work for me. I don't care to be the fastest-growing. I care to be one of the most respected. And uh, that's why I, I've just been so much more motivated to continue to put out just, like, high-quality products you know companies that i see that are doing it and that have just been around forever that's the company that i kind of like tend to try to be well if we go by your definition your very own definition of why you started the company in the first place then i got news for you buddy you actually made it 
you know, because you used that word earlier, you said, I just want to make it. And I think yeah. that that sometimes can be a confusing thing to throw out there into the universe. Because if you say you want to make it, it's like uh, it's a never ending game. You're like, because what does that mean when you actually do make it, when you actually do have a million, two million, five million, six million, eight million, ten million in the bank, it'll never really be enough because maybe you didn't define what making it means. But it sounds to me like you're doing it because you had a goal to make the best possible products that you can within reason, because sometimes it's like it's hard to source certain materials. And there, there's there's some other complications right. to having supplements. And there's reasons on why supplement companies aren't only obsessed with being the absolute best possible creation they could ever make because it can just be like not feasible at some point but in accordance to what you laid out for yourself sounds like you're doing it man i'm definitely trying we 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 do a lot of work you know and my you know i drive to my manufacturer quite a bit and the uh the ceo of that manufacturer he actually tells me has told me that he has never seen a ceo inside his manufacturer so much and sits there and tests and does everything until it's like perfectly done and that's it i don't i unless i feel like it's 100 ready to go i just i'm not in a rush to get it out i make sure i test and i test and i test myself and if it's not good enough for me then it's not going to be good enough for the people and i feel like that's just what you got to do you know to uh make a respectable um company that's you know will have longevity in this industry uh, what about um, like marketing strategies and stuff? Because you see a lot of supplement companies that will promise like everything, like X amount percentage more muscle growth if you take this one creatine or anything yeah. like that. So how does it make you feel when you see stuff like that? And how do you plan on you know attacking that for your business? So I allow with companies like that, which when a lot of them will say a lot of bullshit. We know this, you know, and uh you know, thank God nowadays that there are people out there in the YouTube world that will eventually slowly rip those companies apart. So my strategy is to allow them to just destroy themselves internally, uh, keep my he- keep my focus forward, keep my head down and just stay on the grind and just keep doing what it is that I think is respected and what I believe in. Um, I don't go out there and try to promote all this bullshit. And my customers and the people know that, you know, like I've had people that want to sit there and talk to me about, are you going to create a testosterone booster? And I'm like, look, man, there's just not enough scientific fact behind testosterone boosters. I feel like that I feel good enough to make something and tell you guys that it's going to do this for you. If there's not a lot of scientific backing behind it, I just can't do it. I just, I just don't have it in me to sit there and make a testosterone booster without any type of scientific backing to promote that it actually does help do what it does. And so I just don't make it. And let me tell you what, testosterone boosters – those are big, massive margins, huge margins. I just, but I just can't sit sit down and and do it. I, I get it all the time, and I'm very blunt with you. I say, look, I just, I'm not going to do it. I just don't. I don't know if it'll do what. If I tell you this is what it does, I don't know if it's really going to do it. So I just don't. And um, I feel like if I just stay like that, those other companies that are out there promoting all this crazy stuff and saying that I'll do all this. There's some uh, scientific YouTuber, you know, that's going to go out there and annihilate them slowly. So Mm -hmm. I just stick to the grind. So what is it that you guys focus on in terms of total products right now? So for me, like my whole thing is just performance based, really. You know, I have a little bit of pump products, uh, you know, with like the primitive, you know, it's a really good pump product. It's uh, no caffeine at all. Um, You know, and and, and that's the thing. It's a pump product. So with that being said, it's like, we didn't add caffeine because we don't want to constrict the blood vessels, you know? So without caffeine, you know, we added a little bit of focus, added pink Himalayan salt into it. And that's what you get out of it. You get really good pumps out of it. Um, you know, with like uh, my creatine formulation, we added um, anti-inflammatories in it, not just a creatine blend um, because of performance athletes. You know, we want to try to get the inflammation down as fast as we can. That's going to speed up recovery. That's going to speed up uh, soreness that you have. Um, you know, as, as you guys know, the more inflama- inflamed that our bodies are, you know, around our joints and stuff, that's the, the more pain it's going to cause down the road. And uh, the goal is to get the inflammation down around the joints as fast as we can so that people can not feel as sore, not feel like they're in pain all the time and to uh, speed up their recovery. So I kind of just base mine around like main focus things, you know, pre-workout with like a stimulant pre-workout to kind of give you that kick in the ass. Uh, you know, I put in a KSM 66 in it as well. That helps with like adrenal gland and, and blood pressure and stuff like that. Um, 
you know, so that's, that's what we're doing. That's what I'm trying to do over here. I'm not trying to get so fancy. I'm just trying to do the basic stuff. That's just, I feel will actually help athletes. When you're tired from putting in these uh, kind of long hours, has your your history, you know, been something you've been able to pull from, you know, being able to deadlift 600 pounds and being in the condition that you're in uh, from having been blown up in a war? Like, are, are these things that kind of help you have a little extra reserve and, and dig deep and, and maybe work harder than the guy standing next to you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really good at functioning off being really tired. <laughs> yeah. I, the military will do that to you. Um, I'm, I'm amazing at infantry naps, you know, little 10, five, 10, 15 minute quick nap and I can go for hours. So yeah, I, I, absolutely. I'm, uh, I feel like some of the military stuff and some of the stuff has always carried over to what it is that I'm doing, you know, just learning how to suck, you know, in just a different <laughs> type of way, you know, and it does get tiring sitting there staring at a computer sometimes. Um, but you know, with this company, I do everything with this company. I, I, I do everything, you know, everything that everybody sees. I mean, I'm, I'm in the warehouse. It's 104 here in the Valley right now. I'll be in the warehouse, packing orders, restocking the shelves, doing inventory, printing the fucking packing labels. Like I sit here and do it all myself right now, you know? And, uh, uh, so it, I do get tired and, uh, I do feel like a lot of the military has a uh, pushed over into that as far as learning how to suck and handling being tired and staying focused when you're tired. One of the reasons I wanted to, wanted to have you on the show today was to get some of your perspective on some of the different things that are going on in today's world. You know, being somebody that that is a veteran, and uh, you know, seeing uh, you know monuments getting taken down. Uh, there's you know. The, the talks of, uh, you know, what Colin Kaepernick did a, a while back uh, get sparked up again about, uh, you know, disrespecting yeah. the flag and, and, and things of that nature. Um, and just wanted to get some of your perspective and, and, you know, what are some of your thoughts? You know, you did you are someone that actually went out and, and fought for the country and then to kind of yeah. see these things happen. You know, I, I'm not sure, like, if it was me, I'm not sure if I would be. Uh, like maybe I would be somewhat excited about, about the fact that we have the freedom to even do that. Like, I, I just want to get your perspective on it though. Uh, you know, I feel like right now the country is running off a, 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 an enormous amount of emotions. You know, there's just a lot of emotions going on right now. Um, I feel like that's part of like, you know, the monuments being torn down. I think there, I mean, people are tearing down monuments. that don't even make sense why they're tearing them down. <laughs> right. They just see a monument. I'm tearing it down, you know, there's been military monuments that are getting, um, you know, vandalized and it doesn't make any sense. Like why world war two veteran, like KIA guys, monuments are getting an annihilated. It doesn't make sense. So, um, and, it, and, and, and it kills me to see some of that stuff. I, I did a little post about that, that it kills me to see a lot of the military monuments and memorials getting just annihilated. And it's just why, you know, and it's just what, what, what did it, any of them have anything to do with any part of this, you know, that's going on. And uh, so it has sucked, you know, and, and I sit there and I try to, I, there's been many times where, like I said, there's, you know, where I've got on, and I was just enraged and I wanted to just say a bunch of shit. Um, and then I realized that right now at this time and place, you, not a single person can walk outside and say the sky's blue without somebody shitting on you and disagreeing or making it that, no, you're wrong. No. You, so it's just, what I've realized is that you just can't, there's just nothing that anybody can say right this time. I mean, I watched the rock right uh, post a really good message and I thought it was great. He, he wasn't biased on any side. He said something great. And then he got annihilated. Mm. You know, you got drew Brees who said that he would just never kneel on the flag and this and that he got annihilated. So I have just decided to go ahead and just sit back, let the world, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing that I can say that is going to change what is happening. There's just one too many people out in the world right now that are just so emotionally distraught and you got to let it run its course. That's and, a great vantage point. People are just a bit irrational at the moment, or maybe a lot irrational just because they are running off of emotions. They can't really choose. At the same time, I understand it, but mm -hmm. you can't, I could sit here and tell everybody all day, you can't run off emotions, but it's not that they're going to, that's just the way human, human beings are. Uh, that's the way a lot of human beings are that have not been into a situation or have had to handle things like this uh, and, and have to learn how to deal with them emotionally, um, where their first thing is to um, destruct, run off anger, 
instead of sitting back. I mean, they may sit back here in the next couple of years and be like, damn, I, you know, I probably shouldn't have done that one. You know, I've done that many times in war, did some shit was like, eh, fuck, probably shouldn't have done that one, you know, and it happens. And so I, I, I understand it. Um, you know, I, I, I did a little post that for some reason I could not get to load up on Instagram. I don't know if Instagram was blocking it or what they were doing, but it was not letting me load it up. And it was probably, I felt, I, I took a lot of days away from everything. And then I was just on a walk and I felt like it was the first time that I felt I was about to speak. And I don't, what I was about to speak about, I don't think that anybody could have said anything bad about it because there was just nothing bad to say about it. And uh, it was about what's going on. Um, it, it was really about the, uh, uh, how I feel about what happened, um, and what I feel about law enforcement, you know, so, um, I couldn't post it, but you know, I tried, uh, many times, but, um, you know, just right now, it's just so emotional. I think that there's just not anything that you can kind of say or do right now. Well, what was it that, I mean, if you don't mind mentioning it, what was it that you were going to post since it wasn't able to actually post up? So, well, I mean, it was like. 30 minutes long. So I'm not going to do the whole thing. And I probably couldn't even re- rephrase it like I did, but you know, I saw, I woke up one morning and I saw this whole defunding the police thing. Okay. And, and to me that does that, 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 that seems like that would be counterproductive to defund the police. Instead, I feel like, and I, and, and, and before, while people are listening to this, before you start getting enraged that I'm about to say this, listen to me fully is that I think you should, fund the police a little bit more and the reason that is is because i am a firm believer i have thought this for the longest time before any of this happened that i feel like law enforcement lacks training i feel like they do not have to go through a lot of training to become police officers i get i get pretty pissed off when i see how fast an officer can draw a gun and shoot somebody in this country when i was in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Afghanistan being the hardest one for me, when I would go out on patrols, there are people that walk around with AK-47 assault rifles, 7.62 round automatic weapon that can shoot you and kill you and penetrate through your bulletproof vest, walking around. I'd also would go into villages, get shot at from the villages, go into the villages, see guys with guns, and can I just go in there and shoot them? No. That how my hands were so tied over in a war zone compared to these, these officers here in our own country. So for me to be able to shoot and kill somebody in Afghanistan, I had to have a weapon drawn onto me, not an assumption of a weapon, Mm -hmm. not seeing a weapon. I had to have the weapon pointed up into my direction to where I then felt threatened. So it bugs me that here in the U S that their threatening levels were a lot different than mine in a war zone. Right. A cop can shoot on you if, you if you go to look like this. He can shoot you. Oh, these guys walk around with AK-4s, swinging them around all the time. I just couldn't drop a dude. And a lot of times knowing 100% that that guy was Taliban, I could not just shoot him. And that is a terrorist. Some of these, How many times do you see people go do something and they shoot them dead and they don't have a gun? Right? Hmm. So it bugged me to hear the whole defunding of the police thing. Because... Officers, I feel like I'm sorry, and I love I love police. Trust me, don't get me wrong. I love the law enforcement, but you can't allow your emotions to control your trigger finger. I have been in a trust me a lot of times where I've been in situations where I watch my soul my 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 team leader get blown up right in front of me, and I couldn't allow those emotions to run into the village that I was about to go into and start raiding, looking for the guys that just blew up my best friend. And my team leader, I had to go in there because there's innocent people in there. There are people that are going to be around in the situation where they don't have no part of it. There's going to be guys in there with guns that just because they have a gun, it doesn't mean that they are one of the bad guys. Right. Mm -hmm. So I can't go in there just dropping people because I had an assumption. I had to be drawn upon. Right. And so a lot of people, when they ask, they're like, well, when you went over there, how did you, did you get like an adrenaline rush? And I was like, yeah, a little bit. Well, how'd you control it? Well, because I trained that situation so much that when it happened, I ran through the motions that I was trained to do. You know, it's like the Navy SEALs. They train so much that they can go into a house and you could throw civilian people at them and they don't, they, they won't even shoot them. That they, you know, it's controlled. And I feel like that law enforcement, they don't train. 
They, going out to the shooting range doesn't train you to handle situations that you're going to handle out on the streets. Okay. And so I always thought like, well, if I was running stuff, why would it, if my police force would be one week on, on the beat, one week training, one week on the beat, one week training. And if you can sit there, can't sit there and tell me, but well, we don't have enough law enforcement. Okay. Well, let's fund the police to build a bigger law enforcement to where you can't have X amount of guys on the beat and X amount of guys training. Because I know as I was in the military, I trained five to seven days a week. Every day we went to work, we were doing some type of training to deal with situations that we could come up upon while deployed. And when there, are, we don't have that many like uh, civilian casualties when it's like one-on-one gunfire. Yeah, bombs and artillery and stuff come in and cause casualties. But as far as us going in, I can tell you right now, there was never not one time in my whole 13 months of point in Afghanistan did we ever shoot a civilian. Did we ever shoot and kill somebody that we didn't want to shoot and kill? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because we have control of our emotions and we're trained. And so the lack of training is what I feel is the problem with what's going on right now. It has no... No, no, people can sit there and say, well, well, it, it was because of racism. Listen, let's just be honest. Not you, not me, not anybody in this entire world is going to know, except for that police officer that was sitting on Floyd's neck, if he was racist or not. Only he knows. Only he knows if he was a racist or not. And if he was, he's a piece of shit. And what he did, period, racist or not, he's a piece of shit. And bottom line is, the way that that all went down was because of lack of training. Because he was running off emotions, and he did what he did. Lack of training, lack of discipline for all of that that just happened right there. And that's the problem with it. That's the problem with law enforcement these days is lack of discipline and uh, lack of training. You so think- instead of funding them and helping them, you, you take the money away. So now they have less training because they don't have the money to do training, mm-hmm. you know, and they have, you know, you just have, it doesn't make sense to me. And that's where I was upset about. And I get it. And people want to see the, if you want to see the police be better, then you got to get them funded and you've got to get them in more training to where they can uh, conduct themselves in a manner that they should. And not just that, when they do fuck up, there should be more disciplinary things. There should be. If you kill somebody, accidents happen. Don't get me wrong. Accidents happen. But like, you know, the Floyd thing, that guy should be put in prison or life. And that's where the problem is. You know, when they're not getting the training and then the, 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 the government's not doing what they should do uh, by law, basically. You know, it's not you shoot somebody, kill somebody, you're just off the police force. That's ridiculous. Because if that's the case, give me a badge. There's probably a couple people that I would like to pop out there. And if you're telling me that I can put a badge on, go out there and kill somebody, and if that's it, just switch I'm just precinct. not a cop anymore, <laughs> fucking sign somebody up. You know what I mean? Do you think and maybe so there's a... The do you think maybe there's also like um, maybe like uh, not not a unified sense of purpose? Like when you when you were in the military and you were going into some of these villages and towns, I'd imagine that there would be a pretty damn precise mission, <laughs> you know, that was uh, that was thought out, that was gone. You know, you go over the mission over and over again. It gets relayed to, you know, someone in charge, that person in charge relays the mission again. And before you go out and do anything and, and maybe in the police department, you know, protect and serve is, is what we know, like from an outsider, like that's what they're supposed to do. And in the case of someone like Richard Brooks, it's like, or or in uh, George Floyd's situation as well, it looks like everyone's everyone's fairly like everyone's fairly safe. You know, George Floyd, he was defenseless. He's on the ground. The guy's got his knee in his mm-hmm. neck. Uh, Richard Brooks. Now, he did run away. He did. He did have he did have a weapon on him. Um, but I liked what you said about we can't really just imply that he's going to go and do a bunch of crazy stuff to it, because some people that are saying, well, you know what he did. He you know he took something off a police officer. He resisted yeah. arrest and he he ran away and he was maybe a, a threat to society. So some people are like, well, maybe he deserved to get shot, right? But the other side of it is, look, man, if we if you go back and pay attention to really what happened, it just really did, it didn't seem like the guy was you know um, 
he didn't seem violent at all. He he really just, uh, I think he was in an unfortunate situation. He didn't want to get in trouble again. It seemed like he gotten in trouble previously. He was also very yeah. intoxicated. And so yeah. the answer sometimes is kind of hard because like, you just let the guy like run the streets. Like we don't know what he's going to do, um, you know, but shooting him seems like it should be like the last, the last resort because it seems like everyone at the moment is okay. Everyone's safe. And the police officer probably, they probably would eventually caught up to him. They probably would eventually yeah. got him. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's hard to say though, because somebody might say, Hey, what if he did something, you know, with the taser to, you know, just an innocent person walking by or whatever, you know, it's like, I, I don't know I if you can imply that. That video, that video I watched honestly dozens of times. I watched it from the beginning to the end dozens of times. And at first, when it, at first, when I first watch it, and I see it all go down, and they do it and they shoot him, I'm like, oh, well, that's that's legit, like, you know. And then I sit there and I try to like, okay, now let's just redo this in a different way. And okay, I'm like, okay, the cops knew. He, it seemed like the cops knew he had a taser. They knew and he had a taser. One, I think for it, sure. Right. If it was one on one, I think the situation could have went the way it went. Because what happens is, is the whole thing is, is, well, he could have turned around, shot him with the taser, and incapacitated him, got, went over, got his gun, and shot him in the face. Got it. You're right. One-on-one, that could have happened. There was two officers there. Okay, that taser's not going to drop two officers. It barely drops one person sometimes. So with there being two-on-one, him turning around, them knowing that taser, should you have shot him? No. Uh, I know a lot of people, you know, they're, well, you shot him in the back. Again, I've watched that, that video over and over. You shot him. He shot him in the back because he's, while he's running, he's turned, you know? Uh, I'm not, I'm never the type of person that would ever probably be able to shoot anybody in the back regardless, you know? Um, if he had a gun, obviously, then probably, yeah, because then you're just spraying bullets down uh, towards us, you know? But a taser gun, that, 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 was, that was the problem. Two officers and a taser gun to me, could have been definitely conducted in a, in a, in a different, in a different way. And I get it. I mean, I heard the same thing, Mark, like you said about, Oh, well, he could have got out there and done something with a taser. Like, hey, if I could shoot somebody with a taser, it's going to suck. I mean, I used to tase my brother all the time. When we were young <laughs> for fun. It's not going to, it's not going to kill you. It's going right. to suck. But it's like you said, they would have caught him. If they would have just let him run, they would have probably caught him that night. They would have probably caught him pretty immediately. You know, um, he's hammered again. He was drunk. Right. Again, he's drunk. Yeah. Again, I watched your video again. And then I saw that he caught that right officer with that right hook, hit him real hard with it too. I think a lot of adrenaline, a lot of emotions took over right, right there. Uh, you go, you know, you got to think a little bit of embarrassment might have happened right, right there. Yeah. This guy was whooping their ass. I mean, let's just yeah. be real. Yeah. Uh, he was. He was getting the best of them. And I think that's where the focus. Off. I think that's where the focus should be. Um, Arresting people and putting someone in handcuffs um, right. as big and as strong as some of us are, man, handcuffing somebody would be really, really difficult, you know, and really that's where the problem that's where the problems seem to arise in many, many situations. They, they go to arrest somebody and it's hard to get someone's hands behind their back and to try to, you know, link some cuffs together. It's it seems like yeah. this that alone seems problematic and and maybe the rethinking of even, you know, some considerations in in terms of how to subdue a subject or, you know, any of these things, I think uh, at the moment should be really uh, looked at and examined. But also, yeah, how do two guys, you know, let one guy kind of do that to them and get away? And how is the taser even like, can't they invent something better so the taser can't get taken by somebody? I mean, there's got to be technology. There's got to be advancements that that don't allow for shit like that to happen. That's a, that's and, and that comes back to another part of the, the training. You know, why did you allow yourself to be in a situation to a guy that take a taser? Right. You know, like, come on. Right, like, right. How did he get that taser off you like that? You know, and, and, and with two of you guys, you know, and again, it's a taser. It's right. not a pistol. Right. You know, and, and, that, and that's it. You know, it's conducting yourself in a way to be able to handle a situation. It seems like a lot of times when these officers get into these, these scrubs, it's like brawls. It's like a brawl, you mm -hmm. know, and I feel like they don't have the training on learning how to detain somebody the correct way. Uh, or if somebody, you know, maybe go start take, maybe each officer start taking combative lessons. You know, sometimes I know I was in the military. I took a lot of, we take a lot of combative lessons for situations like that where we get up in the shit and we're doing hand to hand combat. And we're wrestling somebody on how to, you know, maneuver and put a guy down and, and, you know, learn. Hy how to, hypothetically, you know, what if, 
you know, hypothetically, what if they got him in like an ankle lock or something? I, I'd imagine he's going to probably drop the damn taser. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that shit's right. probably going to hurt right. pretty bad. Right. It's, it's like I said, I've watched all these things and I just, I watch it. I'm just like, what is going on with this? Yeah. You know, I mean, what's it take nine to 12 weeks to be a police officer? You get a badge, you're on the streets. I think about how much training can you really get in before in nine, to 12 weeks to be in a situation where, you know, your first, your first night out on the beat, you got, you get some shit like that and you shoot them because you're scared. And you don't understand the situation. You've never been in that situation before. You've never had the training. You're not. You're not like mentally and physically ready to conduct yourself to handle that situation because you've never done it. And that's the, that's where I think the problem is. You know, it's just like when, when, when we go to war our first time, we get into situations that we've never been in, like realistically been in. But we're a lot of times we've done some type of training that has got us prepared for that type of situation. And I think that's where the problem lies fully af- across the world, to be honest. But really right here in the U.S., I feel like it's just too easy to be a police officer uh, and uh, too easy to just be able to have a, a gun and walk the streets against people like that, that are drunk and act retarded. I mean, every single person has got drunk and done some dumb shit <laughs> that night. He got drunk and did some dumb shit and he died for it. And it's unfortunate. You know, it, it's like we, the, you know, the idea that you're talking about in terms of training makes so much sense because even it seems like <laughs> things are being done. So, we don't have to do more work because the amount of work yeah, it's going to like take to restructure processes like the Richard Brooks situation. He was asking if you could go home. OK, let's say there's two officers. You got this drunk guy that wants to go home. You breathalyze him. You know, he's super intoxicated. How about this? How about you find a way to get him home? You let him know you're going to come there in the morning and you guys will deal with things then. Like what if that was yeah. a process that they could have done? rather than all this other BS. And then there's the other thing. I think they're getting rid of chokeholds, right? Within the police force. But chokeholds are so useful. It's just, you can't have these emotional. Especially one-on-one, yeah. You can't have these emotional officers doing it when they don't know when to let go of a chokehold, but it's one of the best ways to detain someone safely. And now we're just going to get rid of it because we have untrained individuals or, or people with lack of training using something super dangerous because they don't know how to use it right now the likelihood of you using your gun probably increases a lot it's like that was one of the things we could have done so they don't shoot people but now we're just saying no chokeholds right it does make sense to me well that's that's the problem that and that, yeah and that's the thing is like they're trying to get rid of all this stuff to where they don't shoot people but you're almost giving them no more options but to shoot people you know and and it's crazy it's it's like i said it's crazy it's it, the defunding the police thing has just driven me crazy it's just it just doesn't make sense it's so counterproductive it just doesn't make any sense i think there's a lot of stuff so they can go to training i think there's a lot of stuff that needs to be like audited and people need they need to like reinterpret some of these things even even the laws in like minneapolis when i heard about you know the particular laws they have in terms of restriction of what you can do to somebody's throat uh the officer wasn't even in violation of any of those things as Mm. as as much as people would be uh you know, profoundly pissed off about a statement like that from, from what I've heard, it's, it's fairly true because the language, d- d- there's no language about, you know, what he did, you know, what he did, obviously he, he, he knew what he did was wrong. Um, you can tell by this, the way he's like sitting there and everything else. Yeah, and we can, we can look back on it and we can, we can figure out ways of, of getting rid of that. But even the very laws that we have and just the protocol that we have, a lot of it, a lot of it needs to be fucking checked. You know, a lot of it needs to be yeah. looked into further. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Floyd foaming out of the mouth, pretty good sign. You need to fucking probably get up. Uh, urinating. I don't know if you saw that it looked mm-hmm. like urination was coming out. That's your body you know, right. shutting down. Um, how you not, how do you not see that? And what it was is I, we, none of us, nobody's going to know the beef of between those two guys. I guess they've had run-ins before from mm-hmm. my understanding, um, what that whole situation is, but you know, it, what drove me crazy is that he was such a, he, he was such a piece of shit that he just sat there right. on, his, on his neck with his hand in his pocket. It's not, you know, he's not like he was sitting there fighting this big ass dude where he was trying. I mean, this guy was, you know, you're pleading for your life. I mean, that's that. Like I said, I, that's why that was probably one of the most vicious videos I've ever seen in my in, in my life that I've been living. You know, and uh, I, I could, I've told many people not to watch it because you literally get to watch an execution on on camera. And uh, you know, I, I I do understand the outrage of the people. You know, um, again, 
whether or not it was racist or not, nobody's going to know but that officer. He's the only one that knows. But the one thing that I can tell you is that that officer was poorly trained and not disciplined enough and shouldn't have even been in a uniform. And that's that's the bottom line. And maybe if they do better training and, and things like that, maybe then that it wouldn't have happened. Maybe it would have because deep down he was a racist. We're never going to know. I also think we're never going to know. But unfortunately, Floyd paid for it the rest of his life. And now that cop is going to pay for it for the rest of his life now, too. I also and, think you just look at like the rest of the people that were there and you look at, uh, yeah. again, like the Rashad Brooks situation and some of these yeah. other situations. Is everybody else OK or, or are they in harm? You know, are, are they yeah. are, are they go- are the people that the police are supposed to protect? Are they in danger or not? <laughs> Uh, it looks right. like they're not. It looks like everybody's okay. So chill the fuck out. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, my thing is, is once you once you detain somebody, and you have somebody in cuffs. What what are they really gonna do? Yeah, if he ran like, away, so just, what? Where's he gonna get go? Up off him. Yeah, I'd get up off him because if they try to get up, they're gonna look retarded trying to stand up, <laughs> yeah. their hands behind their back. I mean, what are they, what are they gonna do? I mean, they're gonna headbutt you to death with their hands behind their back because they are. Call Dana White and signing them up for the UFC right now. <laughs> right. Uh, Jesus Christ! I mean. That's what the problem is. It's, you know, again, I literally will say it again. It, it comes down to training and it comes down to all those officers having the lack of training of the situations to deal with situations emotionally. And that's what it is. It, those guys were running off adrenaline and emotion. And none of us are suggesting that we have uh, officers trained more so they're more aggressive and so they cause more trouble. I think that some people are kind of oh. looking at that. And it's like, no, no, no. I don't think anyone's in favor of anything like that. We just want them to have more knowledge so they're more secure so they make better decisions uh, that are less deadly. You know, the, the, the situation where they pull out the gun is literally the last resort because the person in question is potentially going to kill or hurt somebody else or hurt themselves or mm-hmm. kill, kill a police officer or something like that. That, that's the only time, right? Right. I mean, I mean, let's. How many times have we seen officers do these shootings and they like dump a clip into somebody? What? Where ever happened to control rate of fire? <laughs> like, I never was overseas and I was just like with my rifle. You know, these cops can will dump a magazine into a in, into a person, a civilian here in the United States, and it's again, they're just. They're just not trained good enough to handle the situation. So they allow their emotions with their trigger finger and it rattles off. It's crazy. And it's, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, you know, not a lot of people know this, but, you know, one of my soldiers, when we got back from deployment, he was actually shot, shot and gunned down in his doorway by a young sheriff that got scared because he came to the door. And when my buddy came to the door in Washington, he could have a gun. Uh, he came to the door with a gun and the officer dumped six bullets into his chest jesus oh, then pick up the rifle then pick up the shotgun didn't do anything and my other soldier watched him die on the couch oh man we did 13 months deployment and he got gunned down in his damn doorway all because he had a, gun, a, a shotgun strapped across his chest and you know and he died you know and that's the problem that's the that's the problem with what's going on you know and um and um i like I said, the defunding of the police thing is, is, is the most ridiculous, counterproductive thing that I think is going on right now. I'm just going to have worse officers to choose from at that point. <laughs> God. Well, yeah, I mean, think about it. How many people really want to go be a fucking cop right now? Nope. You know what I mean? You just, you, I mean, you, I mean, cops are walking out of Atlanta. Everybody's done. Mm. You know, uh, chiefs are retiring. I mean, everybody's done. And I, and, and, and I do, I, I get it and I don't get it. You know, I get it because now it's like, oh, you're taking, you're making it more, we can just, you know, we're out there. If we shoot somebody, we're going to prison. No, just do what you're supposed to do the right way. You know, just don't kill somebody, don't kill an innocent person, and you're pretty much not going to go to prison. Some of it's my understanding, too, that you really can't defund the police the way that people are thinking anyway, because a lot of them are already in line for a pension. And so yeah. it's prepaid for. So you're not going to be able to you're not going to be able to all of a sudden allocate money uh, to a new yeah. destination. And if you were, it wouldn't be for many, many years because these people yeah. are going to get paid the rest of their lives, usually. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I just I just really that, that was kind of like what I spoke on the other day. It wasn't, you know, it's 
there, you can't really you can't really say anything bad about that. You can't ever really want right. less training for the guys that are supposed to be out there, you know, protecting us. You can't really. So that was like my whole thing. That was like something I really have been thinking about. I've thought about it for a long time, but I always thought it was real easy for anybody to kind of be a police officer and have a gun and be on the streets and 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 come up on any kind. I mean, the um, uh, I can only imagine the crazy amount of situations that they come up on. You know, here here in this world, you know, but you got to be trained up and ready to deal with it when it when it happens. Yeah, none of us, by the way, are saying that being a police officer is easy either. I think we all no. understand it. It's extremely difficult. We've never been in their shoes, so we can't really say for sure. What are some things that are you're you're maybe sharing with your daughter or if any about just kind of all the craziness that's been going on between like COVID nineteen and and what we've seen after the George Floyd situation? So. The COVID-19 thing, I, I've just tried to explain to my daughter what it's about. Um, I feel like kids are okay with it because they just think they're wearing these cool ass masks around and stuff, you know? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, my daughter, I mean, she's, she, she's like, I got her new mask and she thought it was awesome, you know? And, cool. and um, you know, but with the COVID-19, I try to explain to her and I am more and I'm just trying to teach her how to be a little bit more sanitary. Um, you know, you can't be putting your hands in your face, your mouth and stuff. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong, it was real tough there for a while being out of school being yeah. locked down at home and her, you know, they, you know, kids getting bored and not knowing what to do. And, you know, my daughter's thank goodness is very like crafty and into crafts and into TikTok and making videos. And <laughs> she's a very creative person. So it was a little bit easier for her. You know, we would uh, grab the quads and me, just me and her would take out and go to the middle of nowhere. We write quads and kind of get it in and do things like that. So the COVID-19 thing, you know, I'll try to explain to her what it is, try to uh, make her understand about, you know, just she needs to be a little bit more sanitary and things like that. Um, as far as like what's going on in the world, Mark, this is probably the first time that I've ever hidden something like this going on away from my daughter. I have hidden this completely from her. I do not. I'm hoping that she doesn't learn about this until she's like in high school and they're learning about it in history. Um, uh, I think it's very, it could, it could scare the hell out of a kid. Mm. And I do not want my daughter um, knowing what the world is right this second. You know, because I'm hoping when she gets a little bit older and she starts living in this world, it's a, it's a lot better. So, uh, you know, as of right now, it, it's it's candy and rainbows out there right now for her. And uh, she has no clue what's really going on right now. Um, not just that. I don't think that the world even has a clue what's really going on right now and what's really going to be happening in the future. I think everybody is kind of shell shocked right now at what's going on. Um, and. I'm just hoping that it, 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 it gets to a point where um, everybody on all sides of how they feel and their beliefs about this um, kind of come to a conclusion that things are training, that things are changing for the best and that the world just starts to, to roll again like it was, you know, not so long ago before this whole Floyd thing. And, and at the same thing, you know, at the same time, um, you know, the, uh, this whole Floyd thing, uh, it, it did need to happen in a way. You know, it did need to happen in a way. And unfortunately, you know, Floyd had to take the blunt of that to make a change. Um, you know, he didn't get to he wasn't able to go out there and voice his opinion on the change and make uh, make the world change just off his mouth. Um, it, it, it took his it took his life to change what has needed to be changed. And, um, uh, you know, all you can kind of do is sit back and, and kind of thank Floyd in a way. And I know a lot of people are like, how are you going to think he's not a hero? Well, the guy's dead. And the world's changing and hopefully, hopefully it'll be changing for the worst or for the best, because if not, it changed for the worst. And, you know, Floyd kind of died for nothing. And that officer is going to kind of go to prison and nothing kind of changed. So it was all kind of like a wash. And that's that, you know. Um, uh, it, so I like I said, I've just kind of I'm just I'm just hoping by the time she's a little bit older that things are a little bit better. Is there anything that you learned specifically in training that that helped you um, to be able to deal with emotions maybe better than the next person? I mean, especially because you're somebody that had to live the rest of your life with the battle injuries. Um, Has there been anything specific that was like learned or taught or was it just more conditioning over like a long period of time? Definitely conditioning over a long period of time. You know, uh, I still to this day have to like take a step back to control myself emotionally. Like I said, with like getting ready to post something or do something, you know, I kind of take a step back, you know, and uh, try to let it run its course myself, try to sit back, you know, and if I'm emotional, I let my emotions go down and then I 
think about everything that's going on and thinking about what I want to write or what I want to post or what I want to go out and do, you know, or say. And uh, so I just think conditioning over time. And I, I honestly, like these kind of things that are going on, um, the whole entire world's getting conditioned right now, uh, you know, on how to control their emotions. I mean, they're going to learn a lot um, after, after what has gone on, you know, these past, you know, couple of weeks. Has there been a time where you've noticed uh, maybe in battle where being overly emotional was useful? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the time with Tom Troy, my team leader got killed. Um, I don't, that was the very first real hardcore death that I had to deal with. He was uh, a private when I got him and then he became a team leader with me. And then he was a team leader under me as you know, he's my, I was a squad leader. And, um, I, like I, you know, I watched him, I watched this great human being just get obliterated by a bomb right in front of our eyes walking, you know, and, um, it was very, very emotional. And, um, it took, it took us, uh, over three days to find major parts of his body to be able to sit home. Um, uh, because at that time he was just dust off one. So that means he was missing an action, um, uh, because we couldn't find any major parts of him. Um, so it was very hard to control our emotions going through the villages, going through, um, you know, the, the tree lines and, 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 and the, the orchards and stuff like that, looking for him. Um, at that same time, you know, we're, we're countering enemy forces that are attacking us while we're in there. So we're still in the fight, but we're also looking for our guy and it's very hard to control, you know, or you, you, as much as you just want to sit there and just start shooting everything, you can't. You can't you let those emotions control what's going on. Um, it, a lot of times, if you do that, it's going to end up a lot worse than um, what it was going into it. So, yeah, I mean, it, it has helped me out a lot in times. My emotions, you got to control them. Um, with that being said, because I was so emotional uh, and we were so it made me so determined that, you know, we were so exhausted for so many days of fighting and looking for his body. You know, it's very hard to control those type of emotions while being like pure exhausted, you know? And so it was, it was, it, there, there was, it, there was a lot of times that I was in those kind of situations. Um, and you do have to kind of control what's happening. Um, especially when you got, you know, something that can take a life very, very quickly in your hands. Um, so yeah, I have been in those situations and I do understand it fully. Um, and uh, there has been a lot of times in combat and training that, uh, uh, I've learned to just control those, those emotions during those types of situations. You know, but at the same time, you have to understand, Mark, is that, you know, when we go over there, just like these officers, every time they go to their, their you know, their precinct and they get into those police cars and they step, they drive out of that police parking lot every single time they have to understand that it's, it's today, tonight for these next eight hours or 12 hours, however they like to work, you know, it is life or death. You know, it is not, it's, you can't get complacent because sometimes if you get complacent, it'll catch you off guard. And that's when you make mistakes. And uh, with us, every time we, we always rallied up together before we went out, made sure nobody's complacent. We knew what the uh, mission was at hand. And you go out there and you conduct yourself in that way that, you know, it could be life or death. Let's go out and let's let's do this, you know, and you go out and you're just ready for it. Prepare your mind for shit to happen. And then when it happens, you're already kind of in that mindset for to uh, deal with the situation. And I think police officers need to kind of start getting themselves into that because, yeah, it's not always going out there and just driving around a police car, giving out tickets, you know, at any given time, a call comes on that radio and you, you know, you might be in the shit with something that you, you know, you might be in a wake go or some shit like that. You don't know what somebody's got brewing over or the Las Vegas thing. Nobody was prepared for that Las Vegas thing to happen, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, you just, you just don't know. So you, every time you roll out, you got to have that mental, you know, mindset to it's, it's, it could be life or death today. Let's go out and let's do what we're, we're trying to do. But, you know, let's kick ass, but let, let, let's uh, let's protect the people at the same time, you know. And uh, when the shit pops, pops off, you know, they should be mentally uh, uh, ready to handle it based off of the sheer amount of training that they do all the time, which they are not doing today. I find it so interesting when I hear individuals from the military like yourself talk about this situation. It's like you guys are all echoing the same sentiments. It's, it's all the same thing. More training, more specific situational training. It's just like, mm -hmm. why don't we have more individuals from the military having a hand in helping the police force in some way? I, 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 yeah. I don't know how that structure is, but it's just like you guys are saying all the things that need to be done, yet it's never been done. 
well, it's just with the, in the military and what we do, you can't possibly overtrain for that. Mm. You can't overtrain your mind for those situations. The more training, the more you do, the better, and the more uh, ready you are to handle those situations when it comes. There is no, there is no such thing as overtraining in the military. That's that's where the difference is. Mm. There is no overtraining. You can't get enough training, and uh, and over here it's lack of training. You know, and it's, for example, like, you know, like you said, yeah, we do get ourselves prepared for these situations. Cause like, I mean, when I was in, when I thought I was getting ready to go to Iraq my second time, I was in, um, I was at Fort Irwin. We just got there and we're getting ready to go to through one month of training of Iraq training of getting ready to be in Iraq. Right. We're getting ready to deploy to Iraq while we were there. We get right hook side blinded. They're like, you guys are now going to Afghanistan. War just came down from the top. You guys are going to be the first striker brigade to ever go to Afghanistan. So what did they do? They put us, they put a stop on us for a week there, went and redid everything to get us to train for Afghanistan instead of Iraq because it is two different animals of war fighting. So we then stopped what we were doing, and they, that, they, that training all went from Iraq to Afghani training. And we started training like that. You know, it, it, that, that's because that's what you have to do. You can't train for this situation and then – get thrown in this situation, not understand how to conduct yourself over there or what to prepare yourself for over there because it is two different beasts, you know? And that's, that's just, that is, I agree. I, I, I don't know why the military doesn't have their hands in a lot of this. Um, I feel like there should be, you know, some, you know, maybe retire Navy SEAL guys that they bring in and they pay a good amount of money to train different people, bring, uh, you know, guys that got out honorably from the infantry and things like that. You know, when I first got out of, uh, when I got back and I was in San Diego and I just got done, um, you know, finally retiring from the military, um, I did go down and work with the U.S. Border Patrol for a while uh, down in San Diego. And when they figured out my tactical and training knowledge, they put me into a room to watch these guys um, prepare a mission to go out on. And I just sat in the back. And when they got done with it, they pulled me into a room. They said, what did you see and what could you do better if you were them? And I told him everything because none of those guys in there had any type of military tactical training. And in San Diego, in that area, these guys are going through the brush and they're in the woods and they're, I mean, there's, it's pretty crazy out there. People don't realize what's really going on over there on the border. I couldn't believe what was going on over there on the border. And uh, then they had me come in and, and brief these guys on things that they could do better tactically to take and capture those guys that are coming over those drug Lords and stuff like that, or, you know, anything and everything, you know? And, yeah, I, I agree. I think that the military should have um, some hands in on things because we do do a lot of training. Like I said, you don't get a lot of days off. Monday through Friday, at least minimum, you're training every single day. It's not sitting around doing nothing, you know. So, um, you know, like I said earlier, I, I really wish that, you know, they can make it a way where it's, you know, tactical training one week and then you're working one week. I mean, your working is working. That's what we used to do a lot. We would train for a week and then we would go out and conduct missions, you know, uh, here in the States, you know, we mission plan, do all this stuff, train, 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 you know, and then go out and, and do the, do the mission that we, you know, we were training for the whole entire time. And if they could go in there, I mean, come on, they all know domestic, you know, domestic calls. They know how those are a lot of those are going to go. Well, put it in a situation where if this domestic call does this, then this is what you guys should do to do, to do this. If a guy pins himself in a house, this is what you guys do to do this, to get into the house and, and go in there. And, and I guarantee you there's a lot of cops that could not enter and clear a building the correct way. I guarantee you, you know, uh, could they, could, would I, would I trust honestly, and this is me being awesome. This is no, nothing against officers, but I would be scared to death to be in a house as a, as a hostage or a civilian to have not SWAT because SWAT trains that, but have, cops come in within if, with the bad guy inside there with a gun to trust to shoot him instead of me i would be probably pretty freaked out you know because at, at that time you're telling me that if you can't conduct yourself in a way to not kill a guy running away from you with a taser gun how are you going to go into uh, enter and clear a building with a guy with a gun it's going to be pretty pretty tough right yeah. it's it just comes down to like the percentage base of like what they've done compared to what they haven't done. And that just comes down to, like I said, this whole, this whole, this whole thing revolves around training. And, uh, I just like, I, I just truly think if they got more of it, 
that there would be less of what's going on around right now. Casey, what's the major uh, hurdle standing in your way of you getting some training in yourself, some get, getting back into lifting and being more accountable with your fitness? What do you think is – you mentioned time being something. Is it possible for you to you know, get your training done uh, you know, early in the day as the first thing, so it's like literally the first priority, or, or what do you think you have to do to uh, get back in touch with your fitness? Well, I, I did it on the show right here. I called myself out. There we go. Uh, I know, love it. I called myself out, and that's just the way it is. And I, you know, I, I was already planning on calling myself out. Um, you know, you know, I've always lived with that whole no excuses mentality, and it's like I'm mad at myself because I've been promote. I'm like I preach it, and I'm not <laughs> conducting it myself, and I'm pissed off at myself. You know, and and I think that when people can sit back and and, and be pissed off at their own selves for what they're lacking, I mean, I think that's like the, the greatest motivation. You know, and uh, I, I know what I'm doing wrong. And I and, um, you know, I don't want to give myself a time frame of the day of when I need to be training. I just need to fucking train. Mm. I just need to do it and uh, have no more excuses about it. You know, uh, you, you know, my mind hurts. My body hurts. Everything hurts. OK, well, you know, you're going to feel a lot better when you get done doing what it is that you haven't been doing in a while. So, mm. um, you know, like I said, there's just guys like you, Andy, Rock, all these guys that are just they, they work all the fucking time and train all the fucking time. And, uh, so there is no excuse for it. It's just, uh, me being a little bitch and, uh, you know, for the first time ever for pretty much, I feel like, and so, you know, I'm just, I, I already did it. I, I called myself out and this is that, that, that was it. That's all I needed to do right there. What I would encourage you to do is just to try to do like one thing, you know, that way you don't make the workout seem like this big uh, mountain to climb and right. uh, any exercise that you hate, just don't even do them for now. You know, give, give yourself yeah. a little pass to just go in there, get a, get a good pump, feel good and get the hell out of there. Yeah. What I've been doing, I've been, I've been going, I, and I, and I, I hate them. I hate it because it hurts. I hate, I hate walking. I hate walking and I hate running. It just is not, <laughs> does not feel good on my legs at all. But I've been getting up every day and me and the, me and the Husky, we've been going for like, you know, two mile walks every day. Nice. And I've actually been really enjoying it. It's actually kind of like um, letting me get myself ready for the day, but also like letting me clear my mind a little bit. Uh, and, and honestly, um, I sometimes when I clear my mind, I come up with my greatest ideas and my greatest things. And that's what's been happening lately is that I've just been getting up grabbing the old Husky and we've been going out for walks and, and, um, I'm learning a lot about myself. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, coming up with a lot of great ideas. I feel like I see myself getting a little bit more motivated because I'm coming up with these ideas. Um, but it just kind of sets the tone for the whole entire day. So, um, no, I have been doing some things that, you know, differently. Um, but yeah, I, like I said, it's just, it's time to, uh, just, uh, get back on the railroad. Yeah, you said, you know, you fell into a little bit of a funk, but I think you're a great uh, inspiration and motivation to us all and to a lot of our listeners that are listening right now that have been banged up or have injuries or maybe they're in a position like yourself where they're uh, military veterans that have uh, been hurt in, in battle. Um, what What's kind of your motivational speech to get somebody going that, that has, you know, think back to when you were, you know, come recovering from uh, all these surgeries and all these different things that you had happen. And, um, you know, if you could think back to what was the thing that got you the momentum to continue to get yourself into the gym and get a hold of your fitness? Um, it was honestly all of the um, like what ifs is what kind of got me like, you know, back into the gym. Um, all the uh, uh, no ways that people would tell me it's not impossible or it's impossible. You know, those types of things is what kind of got me motivated to get in the gym, you know, it's just like, well, what if you go in there and you do this and you hurt this, or what if you do this, or what if you can't, you know, be 90 years old, you know, playing tennis, or it was just things like that, that it was just like, you know, don't, don't live, don't live in the now, not what's in the future, you know, and, and that's what I just started doing. I started living in the now and I started doing things that I just enjoyed. I knew I enjoyed fitness, you know, I knew I enjoyed it. And, and that's the thing is what people, when they get injured, um, I don't think that you have to go jump into like fitness right out the gate. You just need to find something that you enjoy right out the gate when you're bouncing back from any type of, you know, tragedy or, 
you know, injury or anything like that. Just like you said, just get out there and get a pump and do that and, and, get, and get back in the rhythm and just and, and have fun with it. And so, you know, for me, it was, uh, I, I found, I wanted to get into fitness, but I wasn't good at it yet because it, everything was just so painful. Mm. But I got into golf and mm. I got out there and I was doing something and I was moving around and, and, that, and that eventually slowly pushed me over to like getting in better shape. And, and then getting into, you know, into better shape, pushed me over into powerlifting, you know, and, and now here, here I am back, you know, back into like where I first started, like, and now I'm back into like enjoying golfing again, you know, and getting outside and just taking a break from everything and just enjoying myself. And, and so, uh, you know, if, if, if anybody out there is like hurt or injured or not motivated, just find something that you enjoy right now, live in it right now. And then once you get to a point where you feel like, man, I can do something else, then go do that. You know, uh, you know, fitness is just it, it, the thing that I feel like people get are wrapped around their heads so much with fitness is like, they see all oh, bodybuilding, Why, you know, bodybuilding or powerlifting or that. No, fitness is just getting up and going and doing something. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't have to be hardcore like we do. You know, it doesn't have to be at that level. It could be anything, getting on a bike, going for a bike ride, doing your 20 minute walks like you do all the time, you know, things like that get out and just do that. And usually a lot of times that turns into something bigger down the road. And so that's what I would do. And that's what I've been kind of basically been doing this whole entire time. And, you know, I've had about 42 different types of fitness things that I've wanted to do, you know, ever since I got into this fitness thing, you know, I, I box, I golf, I go on these horrible walks every morning now, you know, it's just, you know, I, I, I did the bodybuilding thing. I do powerlifting. I, you know, done strongman stuff. I mean, you know, it's just, you just, like I said, you just got to do one little thing at a time and it'll turn into something else that you don't even know. Like, you know, when I was golfing in San Diego that I think, you know, six, seven years down the road, I'm going to be doing like hardcore powerlifting. Hell no. Wasn't even in the realm. Wasn't even an idea, you know, but it, it, here it is, you know, and it just started off with just doing something that I enjoyed at that time. And, as you get older and you grow and you do different things, you, you fall in love with different things, you know, and, and you want to do other things. And, and I, and I feel like that's what, I mean, there's so many people in the fitness industry. Now, I mean, you crazy, you know, power lifter. Now you've done bodybuilding. You, I mean, I think, I, I think I even heard you've done CrossFit, you know? So, I mean, it's just, you've done it all. It's just like, and you look at Dana Bailey right now, Dana Bailey's like running track now yeah. mm-hmm. doing, you know, yeah. all this crazy calisthenic stuff. That's an elite bodybuilder at one point. She did powerlifting at one point. Now look what she's doing. When she was bodybuilding back in the day, did she ever think she'd be out on a track running times for miles? No, but she was there and now she's here and that's what fitness is. And that's, and I, I think that's a great thing about it is that you're going to fall in love with multiple types of fitness things as you just get going on one little thing right out the gate. Awesome, man. Thanks for, ha- thanks for uh, your time today. Where can people find your uh, supplements? Um, uh, risinglabsco.com. And then what are, what are some various things you have? You mentioned uh, pre-workout. What else you got? And a pump formula? Yeah, so I have, uh, well, I have three pre-workouts. I have a stem one. I have a non-stem caffeine, no caffeine. It's all for pump and focus. And then um, we have a nootropic one that is a great stimulant. Great stimulant, mind, body, you know, connection, uh, pre-workout. Um, you know, we have creatine, we have the EAAs, we have thermogenic fat burners. Um, we have a great protein that is selling like crazy. It's a, uh, um, a protein like release type of protein has all three proteins in it for it has a sustained release of protein throughout an eight hour period of time. Um, so we just got a lot of good things going over there. You know, I started this company with three products, you know, and I think I'm at like 20 something SKUs now. You know, so it, it's growing good. It's, it's doing well. Um, just, you know, it's just, uh, I would like to see where I'm at in five years. You know, I want to, where I want to be in five years, I want to be there now, but I just, <laughs> I know how that works. You know, every day, trust me, I look at other companies. I'm like, how are they bigger than me? But they just been around a lot longer. So it's just, it's a marathon for sure. Right I now. got a feeling that you'll get it figured out, buddy. I hope so, man. <laughs> where, where can people find you? Uh, my Instagram is that one leg monster. Um, that's pretty much all out I'm on. All right, man. Great to have you on the show today. Have a good rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate you guys. Thank you, sir. See you later. Peace. All right.
case. He's dope. He's awesome, isn't he's he? He's fucking awesome, man. I love seeing the maturity in people, too. You know, we've had him on the show a couple times. Not that he was immature when he first came on the show. But I love seeing just the growth that people have. Like, he's, yeah. just, a di- he's just a different person. Mm-hmm. Just a completely different person. It's cool to see. Because I think, like, if, if some of this stuff would have happened years ago, I think he would be, like, I think he'd be more pissed off and, like, less understanding. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that for somebody that, somebody that lost a body part, you know, I think he's got really good perspective and, and, uh, and like an open heart, you know, to, to be, to understand, look, you know, people are going to, maybe people shouldn't be taking down certain monuments, but they just are. Yeah. They're just going to, cause like, you know, that, that's what happens, right? It's like people want, they want to fight fire with fire. Something wrong happened. It's like, okay, well, something wrong happened to me. Something wrong happened to my people. Something wrong happened here. I'm going to make some wrong shit happen too. That's the way that people think. Mm-hmm. And it, it make I mean it makes sense and it's happened throughout our history. It's it's always happened. It's always been there. Yeah, I think the, uh, what you're saying about growth. You know, I mean, yeah, even in the short time that I've known Casey, like yeah, I've seen him grow a lot. You know, like even just on like checking out his social media, like I've seen him like go crazy on people. He gets pissed and off then, sometimes. Yeah, and then he now, used to, yeah. now to hear him say like you know, kind of like doing the uh, the technique of like I'm gonna post some shit and then you delete it and you kind of feel better because you wrote it out at least. Mm-hmm. But to hear that he is like mm, maybe I shouldn't say that because it you know. Is he afraid of what people think? Fuck no. But he's still being more mature thinking, okay, is it worth being a badass right now to get my, my opinion out there? Or is it better to just take a step back, take a breath, and not post this? So, yeah, you're spot on with that. Yeah. We talked a lot about perspective on this episode. And he had a he has a very good perspective on everything that we were talking about today. Um, it's, it's especially like what he was talking about as far as like training in terms of officers what like i know there are a lot of officers that listen in that are like oh you guys don't know all the things that we deal with we're not saying that being an officer is easy because i think that's like the the knee-jerk reaction to everything you're saying right now it seems like one of the hardest jobs in the world it is it (laughs) absolutely is difficult you don't know who's doing what you don't know who's being honest somebody could just say yeah man i'm just walking down the street and someone else could have just killed somebody you don't know like they could literally be just flat out lying to you or someone could be telling you the truth or someone could have bad intentions for you 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 just don't know Mm -hmm. they 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 really deal with the unknown and they deal with a wide variety of things every day every single call is some type of shit show no matter (laughs) how small or how big it is every single day like we know that they also worry about getting home safe but that's exactly why casey and other members of the military people that have been in training have been saying that you they need more training right Mm -hmm. yeah and i think the richard brooks thing is is a great example of that he he was obviously fearful that he was you know like the officer i'm sure the officer like because in the video he does say something about the taser so it's obvious that one of the officers knows that he he took the taser Uh, at least one of the officers knows he took the taser but when somebody turns around and they have you know their their arm out like that i don't know if you are like oh yeah that's a taser that he just took off you know Mm -hmm. i don't know if you can think that uh that logically at that moment and you know but it but with good training with good training the other officer wouldn't have allowed you would think the other officer wouldn't have been able to allow the taser to get taken in the first place. Or maybe they just rethink where the taser sits. Or I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the, you know, I'm not a police officer. I'm not like in, in combat like that. So I don't really know what the solution is. But I think that at the moment they can kind of start to review everything and poke some holes in everything and say, hey, is this a good practice? I think arresting people is kind of, but I think it's kind of uh it's just really hard, mm-hmm. you know. I don't. I don't know how. I don't know how you would arrest somebody without literally just knocking them out. <laughs> because <laughs> trying to get anyone's hands behind their back is it would be a difficult thing if they if they don't want you to. Yes, but yeah, if they're resisting it and doing everything they can, getting yeah, that's. And me and my son talked about it. I'm like Jake. You know how much I lift and stuff. But like, if you wanted to resist me, you're a young kid. You could resist me. You know. Mm. I'm like it's it's gonna it would be very difficult. It would be a thing for me to try to figure out how to you know handcuff you at that mm-hmm. moment you know so yeah. maybe they should just you know reconsider um some other options some other things maybe look into doing some other stuff you know mm-hmm. i like what uh stick was saying on a previous episode like if it's a d- domestic dispute or whatever send like a marriage counselor or whatever it may be you know if it's this send the person that studies that situation or that uh, you know, is a, an expert in that field. And I'm, I'm also curious to know, because when uh, Casey was talking about, 
you know, like they were training for Iraq and then they had to train for Afghanistan and they were two separate things. So obviously they have tons of intel coming in from both sides. So they mm-hmm. were able to train for that. I wonder how they would obtain or maybe they just watch footage, but like how they would obtain the same type of intel for taking that same military type training for the streets, right? Like for a civilian, uh, the civilian sector versus like, like he said, you can't overtrain for Afghanistan. But again, like this is different, a different right. Uh, area, right. right? Like you, you can't really approach it that way. But I would imagine yeah. a lot well, of even, it would carry yeah. over well. I'm not saying it's right. a bad idea. I think more training is well, and there a good could way. even be some, some s- systemic racism laced in with that as well. Because hey, do this area this way, but do this area that way. Oh, absolutely. Some people might be like, hey, that sounds unfair. Mm-hmm. That we're going to be more aggressive. We'll have <clears throat> even more police here. But you're like, well, maybe. Maybe it just makes sense because maybe there's more crap going on there. Mm-hmm. But it's again, it's hard to, you know, you you, you police Davis this way, but you police, you know, uh, you know oh, Sacramento, yeah, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, this, you know, this other particular way. But we've seen that that's not great either because like weird shit happens in every neighborhood. <laughs> you know, weird crazy stuff happens in every neighborhood. So I just, you know, I I think. I think what we're seeing here, one of the major problems is that there's not a unified, like, self of, uh, there's not a unified sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not a unified mission. What's the mission? What's the goal? You know, all I know of the police, the police force is like protect and serve. I don't know anything else beyond that because I've never looked into it. I don't, I don't know much about being a police officer. But if I'm thinking about what I think that their job is, um, it's like to protect people, you know, from from each other, from from the quote unquote bad guy, from somebody doing something wrong, um, you know, somebody uh, hurting somebody else or, or whatever it might be. And if they can just, ins- you know, try to help ensure that people are staying safe, um, that's a much different mission than like taking out the bad guy. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, it's that's different, mm-hmm. right? Like, like we got to get the bad guy, like. But in what way do you have to get him? You know, you just need to make sure he's contained so he doesn't hurt anybody. You know, I mean, that's my thoughts on it. I don't know. It's not an easy thing to figure out. Yeah, it's tough. And, you know, a lot of people were pointing out in the um, Richard Brooks situation, when the cop shot him, he yells out, I got him. And so that it's like, fuck. Well, and maybe that and maybe that but maybe that's a form of communication Mm -hmm. like uh Maybe he meant it like, yeah, I got him, like as he got away with one, or maybe he meant it as a form of communication of like, hey, he's, he's, he's done, he's done, dude. Yeah, he's done. You know, like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Whether people decide to, you know, like, I think Casey also had a good point. I I think people should, um, should really pay attention to, um, there's a lot of like, for example, uh, Chauvin, right? When he had his mm-hmm. knee on Floyd's neck, there's a lot of people that are, are, are saying racist. He's probably a racist, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, you don't, we don't know if he was or wasn't. And, and that statement in, of a, in and of itself is going to make a lot of people that hear that very angry. Mm-hmm. But I mean, all we know is that he was a very, like he was a cop that had a lot of, a lot of warnings or what mm-hmm. not warnings, but, um, he got in trouble, uh, he got in trouble times, a yeah. lot. Right. And he, he did something really stupid. I don't know if he was racist or not. I think that we need to be careful with how we're like just brandishing that word racist. You know, um, we don't know if the cop that shot Richard was racist. We just know that he was a really, really, he just didn't handle, he didn't deal with that situation well. And a man died for it. We don't know if he was racist or not, but I think, I think right now I just see a lot of people calling certain things racist that, it's, it would be convenient if we could just call it racist, but it might not be. It might just be in cop situations. These are just really badly trained officers that make stupid decisions because their emotions are running high, mm-hmm. just like Casey was talking about. Um, I just don't think racism is racism is a very, very, very uh, it's it's a it's a it's a dirty thing, right? And I don't think a lot of situations are actually racist. There's there are other things that are that those situations are, but racism might not be it. Yeah, when it comes to like um, the Richard Brooks case again, like but you know, do the cops have other defenses against um, him driving drunk? Which is which is which is the main 
that's the that's the main like perpetrator here. That's the main thing uh, that they're trying to avoid, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, could they take his keys? <laughs> you know, could they uh, say, "Hey, we're you know whereabouts do you live, man? Like, can we drive you to your spot?" They can do all these things, but you know that. I just don't know if they're trained to. I don't I don't know if that's a thing they talk about because you would need procedures involved for that as well, because that could that could potentially yeah. not be very safe. Yeah. Um, you know, say they they drop him off at his house and someone gets startled. It's a cop there and, and something else. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But the, they're all things that whenever you enact one thing, you have to start to think about other things. But. It sounds logical that you could, you know, almost like a dad or almost like a friend, you could say, hey, give me your damn keys, dude. Like, you're not going anywhere, mm-hmm. you know, um, but that's not what they normally do. Like, and there are, are they, uh, is a police officer responsible to, you know, be with you for eight hours or something as you sober up or something like that? That's, mm-hmm. I mean, some of that, you know, why don't you just sleep in the car next to him or something like that? Like, that sounds sounds a little overboard, you know, mm-hmm. but like, what are some solutions to make sure that uh, a situation like that doesn't go bad? You know, I think these are all things that would be good to uh, talk about. I know in the, in that particular situation, they were waiting for an officer to get on. They were waiting for another officer to come because he was more of an expert in the breathalyzer test thingy and stuff like that. So I don't know what that was about. Cause they were like waiting for that guy to get dispatched. You would think they would all kind of have good training. <laughs> maybe the first officer, maybe you can make an argument that the first officer wasn't uh, authoritative enough because he was, he seemed excellent to me. Uh, he was super calm. He was, you know, communicating well. He told the guy to get into his car probably 15, 16 times and never once raised his voice. He just, he just said, sir, I told you to stay in the car, please. I told you to stay in, stay in the car. I told you, he was very, very, he was very patient, but mm. maybe that patience and maybe that, uh, uh, maybe being too lenient, uh, maybe is something that kind of, and ended up with the result that you ended up seeing you know i don't know yeah i mean imagine if you know they were that one single cop did have the proper training right to to subdue that one guy but it just yeah it's tough because i i you know people want to jump to like oh but it's going to just give them more uh more weapons to hurt people or whatever Mm -hmm. but it's it's sort of like bullying right like if you teach more kids how to fight then they'll they'll fight more it's like well no actually they'll probably fight a lot less and then with uh with richard brooks like it's tough because you know it's been a long history of stuff like this going on and so like when we say like oh like couldn't they have like given them a ride home or something you know like I'm sure a majority of people would say, well, I wouldn't even trust a cop to get in the back of the car with them to, I, to, to quote, drop me off. Right. I, I honestly would be scared. Of I would be nervous as fuck. Well. <laughs> <car too, bro. laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it's tough. And they're probably not, not to be like, um, not, not to tell them to like, Oh, be a bad cop, but they're probably instructed not to think outside the box. Cause they have protocols. Have, they yeah. have, you know, stuff in place to where like, you know, like what Casey was saying, this is a different situation, but we're like, you can't shoot somebody or pull your gun out unless they point your gun at you or they're okay. gun at you. So uh, I would imagine there has to be stuff like that in place right now that would prevent a police officer to legally or whatever by the book think outside the box to take this man home because he's, you know, like he's not doing anything wrong. He is asleep, although. If you have your keys in your car while you're drunk, you could get a DUI. Oh, sure. We have a lot of we have yeah. a lot of rules and and laws and stuff that are just kind of they're just kind of dumb. Like, and <laughs> oh, we yeah, don't realize yeah, yeah. how dumb they are until a situation occurs. Um, the uh, uh, the young kid that got shot in Florida years ago, um, you know, that was a situation where the um, the off the the guy that that shot him wasn't even a police officer. Trayvon Trayvon Martin, Martin situation. Then mm-hmm. then you like, but in Florida it's weird. You can be like deputized or some bullshit like that uh, to be able to defend yourself in that way. Some something crazy, and then the guy got off. I don't mm-hmm. think the guy got served any time no. at all. Yeah, he got off. Um, but it's like who knows that dumb law exists until you see it 
you know, played out, Mm -hmm. you know, you see it until you see it played out in front of, you know, millions of people. So, and again, like with, with Floyd's situation, the officer, like he wasn't actually really choking him. Obviously he was, uh, you know, um, compromising his airway. That was very obvious. So it's like whatever laws they have in place, if you go, if you go and you actually look at the law, then sometimes, unfortunately, they're not infraction of the, of the actual written law, which is just fucking asinine, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then luckily, you know, we can still charge people with other stuff and we can, you know, still have some sort of logical, thing towards it but i think that was the main thing with the trayvon martin case was that when they actually looked at some of the law it according to the court that they deemed that what the guy did was just which is doesn't make any sense at all it doesn't make any logical sense at all uh but somebody wrote a, a law to be a particular way which i think is um you know was i think i think even the law itself was racist you know so it's we have a lot of stuff that, uh, you know, hopefully people will sift through and hopefully people will comb over at the moment. Hopefully they'll comb over a lot of these things and, and look into it and say, what can be a better way? How can we have, you know, how can we have better protocol? How can we have a better way so that stuff like this doesn't keep happening? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Yeah. It was great to have uh, Casey on the show and, and get some of his uh, perspective on things and, um, you know, I know that he'll get back into his training. He'll get back into his stuff, and he'll be deadlifting over six hundred pounds once again. Yeah, buddy. Savage. Yeah, yeah, guy's an animal. Alrighty. Well, thank you everybody for checking out today's episode. Sincerely appreciate that. If you guys like what you're hearing, please share it with a friend. That's a really easy way to give us a, a huge uh, compliment. And also, uh, ratings and reviews on iTunes. Not just a star review, an actual written review. That helps a ton. Uh, please make sure you're following the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project on Instagram, at MB Power Project on TikTok and Twitter. Uh, my Instagram is at I am Andrew Z. And Seema, if people want to get in touch with you, where you at? And Seema Inyang on Instagram and YouTube. And Seema Inyang on TikTok and Twitter. And by the way, there are going to be a few Smooth Panther videos coming out this week, guys. What? So you guys know. So you guys know. <laughs> that Smooth Panther. Yep. Um, one thing uh, I liked uh, that we got in conversation with with Casey Mitchell was when I asked him if there was ever an incident where he was overly emotional and it was a positive for him. He actually yeah. wasn't able to really answer it as a being a positive. It was actually it seemed it seemed more to me that he got control of his emotions that ended up being the powerful thing. And so uh, my exercise and asking that question in the first place is to kind of demonstrate that it, it would be very, very rare for an emotion to lead to something positive. There are cases where it does, but there's almost always a better way, you know? So someone might say, Hey, I think you're fat. And then you go on a <laughs> diet and you lose weight. But does it have to be destructive that way? Does it have to go down that way? Or could you just have previous knowledge? Could you understand, yeah, you know, I'm a little fatter than I want to be. I'm going to gain knowledge on this subject. I'm going to look some stuff up on YouTube and I'm going to error correct my problems and I'm going to, you know, fi- fix this myself. You could easily do it that way. And normally those things have a little bit more uh, longevity to them when you're able to think about something in a rational way. You, and you, again, uh, we've talked about this before. You try to replace the, uh, the feelings that you have with facts. And as crazy as some of the stuff that he talked about, finding body parts uh. of a friend and a team member, um, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how you, you know, implement like protocol or practices into that, but they did, they, they, they did it. They figured it out. You know, they're like, Hey, look to honor him. We have to find him, you know, and that's, that's our job. I don't, I don't, I cannot imagine what that looks like. I cannot imagine what that would play out to, to look like, to, to search for a friend uh, in that way. And to have seen, uh, I've never even seen anybody like die up close or anything. Like I haven't really seen anything too, Uh, crazy in my life thankfully so I don't I don't pretend that I know anything about it but the fact that they have to they can't just be out there being a nervous wreck and and crying the whole time they won't find them they found them they were able to find them they're able to as crazy as it sounds get his body parts together ship him home give him a proper uh, burial give him a respectful uh, way to go out he probably has a headstone somewhere that people are able to you know pay tribute to and and things like that and so 
you you there's not a, a lot of situations in life. There's really no situations in life where um, it's not an advantage to figure out a way to get a hold of your emotions. So whatever way you can, you know, figure out a way to, uh, you know, reinterpret some of the thoughts that you have and reinterpret some of the emotions that uh, kind of overcome your body. Um, I would just uh, urge you to give them a minute, give them a little bit of a pause and then think about those emotions and think about why you're feeling that way. And then uh, just understand that you can implement a change. You can implement, uh, you can interpret that whatever way that you want. You can interpret that as being sad for yourself, being mad at yourself, being disappointed, or you can say, you know what, this is the situation. This is the way that it is. And I'm just going to replace some of these feelings with some facts so I can act on it the right way. Strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you all later. Bye.